welcome to the Traveler's Blueprint. Start designing your next adventure. Thank you for joining us on the Traveler's Blueprint Travel Around Discussion, where we aim to discuss the beautiful diversity of our planet uh, with, with different people each, each episode. So these episodes air the first Monday of every month, and you can tune into them then. Last Monday of every month. I'm sorry, the last Monday of every month. So It's okay. Yeah. It's like, <laughs> it's, uh, before we get started, though, if you're listening to this and you are yourself in the travel community, in the travel community in some way, and you're interested in joining us for a future episode, please feel free to reach out to us via email at thetravelersblueprint at gmail.com, and we can get you in line on a list to be on a future episode. Today's topic is a deep one, heavy one. So we're going to talk about cultural appropriation and cultural diversity as it relates to travel. But before we do that, I want to take a moment to introduce the panel members. And when when I ask you to to introduce yourself, just tell us where you're located, how you're involved with the travel community, and where people can reach out to you to find your content. Ariel, as the reoccurring guest, why don't you go first? Sure, I'm Ariel Rose. I'm currently in St. Thomas, but I am based in Charlotte, North Carolina. Um, you can find me at I'm underscore Ariel Rose on all social media platforms, and you can contact me at Ariel at ArielRoseInternational.com. Thank you. Lou. Hi. Hi, everyone. So I'm Lou. I'm from Venezuela, but I live in Chicago at the moment, and I also have a podcast. It's called the Solo Female Trolley Podcast. And where you can find me, my Instagram is at the Solo Female Travel Podcast. Thank you. Thank you. Matilda. Hi, my name is Matilda. I'm based in Canada uh, and I'm a travel blogger and you can find my blog at mileswithmoonshine.ca um, or on Instagram at uh, moonshine. Thank you. And Jeanette. Hi everyone, I'm Jeanette, also known as Jet Set with Jeanette, and I'm in between Los Angeles and Nashville. And uh, a little bit about myself, uh, let's see, I'm a writer, journalist, producer, um, TV host, and uh, I also have a, a podcast called Global Conversations. Um, and I'm also the vice president of media for Travel Unity, which is a nonprofit organization that aims for uh, diversity, inclusion, and equity in the travel industry. Wonderful. Yeah, thank you. Thank you all for joining us. This is actually, I didn't even realize this, but I think this might be the first all, you know, full female panel. Female yeah. 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 I, don't know if you, I don't know if you heard the future is female. <laughs> <laughs> I, I have heard that. You know, I, I, I'm all right with it. <laughs> We're one step closer. We have a female mm -hmm. vice president, so. Right. Yeah, That's the first African-American, Indian-American, and female vice president. It's very exciting. And, and you know what? Some of the best leaders in the world right now are women. If you look mm -hmm. and you That's very true. If you see oh. who handled the pandemic the best, it's nations with female leaders. I just want to throw that out there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, didn't, I didn't know that. Um, Australia handled it well. I think they have a man in charge, right? <laughs> I, no, I, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Anyway, that, that could be another topic. <laughs> <laughs> He's a better leader. I don't know if that's a good one to go over, but <laughs> equally, equally divisive in, in some sense is cultural appropriation. And something that Elliot and I wanted to discuss, and it's partially related to the fact that we're a couple of white guys and it's, I don't know, we, we grew up, I don't want to say sheltered. There were, by no means was I, were we sheltered, but growing up a white guy in america everything is kind of catered to us yeah everything is catered to us from superheroes to movie stars and you don't realize that that's not uh a appropriate representation of the world as the united states now as adults we obviously realize that and and so i don't know uh as travelers on top of that it's cultural is incredibly important it's interesting it's what makes inspires people to travel in a lot in a lot of ways so there is, however, this fine line, right? When when is it when is it inappropriate to appropriate culture? I guess is is what we're going to get to. So, I think I'm going to give it to someone else to kind of run with this first, and maybe I'll poke holes and, and ask some questions here and there. So, Jeanette, uh, why don't you get us started? Can you help 
us understand or can you define cultural appropriation? Well, cultural appropriation is, you know, kind of what you were saying uh, earlier, trying to understand and learn uh, different cultures. And I think we all come as individuals with our own backgrounds, our own experiences, um, our own cultures and subcultures. For example, my, my background is uh, Mexican American. You know, I was born in America, but my parents are from Mexico. So I kind of grew up with two cultures and speaking two languages, but that is my individual experience. Um, so I can speak from that perspective. However, it's, it's good that you have these conversations because even myself, I don't know everything about every culture and I don't really think everyone does. So we need to have these conversations and often difficult, but necessary so that we can understand, you know, better understand and mutually respect each other because cultural appropriation is about understanding and giving credit to different cultures, in my opinion. Okay, so so it seems like intent has a lot to do with whether or not you're appropriating or celebrating a culture. Does that sound right? Does that? Sound yeah. So, for example, in my experience um, here in the United States, Cinco de Mayo is heavily celebrated, and it's um, there is a belief, or some people may believe that that is Mexico's Independence Day, which is not. It's actually September sixteenth. <laughs> Um, but in the U.S., it's highly celebrated, and a lot of people may think that it is. Th th there's things like that, right? It's just not knowing or not really understanding the history of a holiday that is being celebrated, which um, it's, it's kind of, it's not to me as offensive, but it's just trying to understand that that, you know what I'm saying? Like being a voice and saying, well, actually, it's not Mexico's Independence Day. Mexico's Independence Day is September 16th and um, having those conversations. Right. Yeah. And what is the the negative thing that comes to? Well, again, I can only speak for myself and in, um, in my experience and from my perspective. But, you know, there's a lot of stereotypes and there's a lot of um, outdated beliefs about um, certain groups, like for example, the Latino Hispanics were not monolith, right? So putting us all together that we all vote the same, believe the same, eat the same, it's just that's, that needs to go. Like you need to really dive deeper into, you know, the different Latin American countries, South America, Mexico, every country has beautiful cultures and history and nature and, and they're so diverse within itself. I think just putting us all together in one big group is, is, is just not doing enough work to understand. Yeah, and I think that the, was, it's lazy. Yeah. Well, I think that was very, very clear in the recent election Yeah. when, you know, different, you know, you're realizing how, you know, we're not monolith. We vote differently. We, it's, so yeah, it's just better understanding. Interesting. Yeah. When you when you say the election, can you go into a little bit more detail with that? Well, I mean, the results just speak for themselves. I mean, I don't go political or talk about politics, but um, you can see in the results and what the, all the statistics are showing. Um, and it's also bringing a lot of new conversations within the media. Um, and a lot of people from the media perspective are finally you know, having their voices and stories shared. So I think it's just, it's a time in history where you're seeing it um, everywhere. Yeah. And I think to expand on that, I think the the election kind of pointed out that uh, Hispanics do not all vote the same, which is what Jeanette was saying. So Miami-Dade County, for example, in Florida is primarily- it's the state of Florida. <laughs> yeah. It, yeah. And uh, they have historically voted Democratic. I mean, for the 2016 election, it was, I think, a two-third split, one-third split. And this election, it was barely over 50%. And that difference in voting just, and what people thought they were going to vote, 
is very different than how they actually voted and putting them into a homogenous group and thinking that they're all going to vote one way is it's not fair to them and it's not fair to anyone else that we do that to. Right. Interesting. All right. Um, I think this is a much different conversation post election, but <laughs> it is, it is. But I think, I think the point of, this discussion is that everyone who is listening to this is a traveler in some way, shape, or form and wants to learn better what the boundaries are when it comes to embracing and celebrating a different culture. And I think we as Bob and I as white men often get the brunt of the cultural appropriation because we want to there are times when we want to celebrate and take part in like Cinco de Mayo, but we are taking part in Cinco de Mayo because it is something to celebrate. We don't know what we're celebrating. We don't know why it's why Cinco de Mayo has significance, but we feel like, oh, it's another holiday that we can have fun or drink or do whatever we want to do. But the point is that we need to understand why we're doing it so we don't appropriate it. As we spoke in the beginning, intent is key when finding the line between appropriation and celebration. Right. Like, for example, if I saw a post of someone who's celebrating Cinco de Mayo, but it has no context or nothing, then I just swipe away because it's, there's no substance. And I think we're going to that age where we want substance. And, and especially in the travel industry, you know, we're past these staged photo shot perfect photos with no substance like you know I think moving past 2021 you know we have right now we're still in the pandemic we're going through so much personally and professionally and you know as a nation I think we want more unity I'm speaking this is my opinion I feel like we want more unity we want more vulnerability. Um, we want more connection and authenticity. And with authenticity comes intention. What is your intention? So if somebody wants to be, you know, um, self-serving or do something just for, you know, likes or what, it's I'm I'm turned off. I don't care because it doesn't add value to my life. And I feel like that's where a lot of people are going, especially in the travel industry. We have an opportunity to really make a movement and to like have these conversations and to educate ourselves and to, um, you know, be allies and to unite. I think this is an opportunity for us as a community. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think we've had um, the conversation before, like the difference between vacationers and like travelers. And I think travelers are, do try to be more cognizant of, immersion like cultural immersion and like having those authentic and cultural experiences without it having to be like fully dressing up in another culture's um you know like formal wear or something like that like being able to experience a culture without appropriating it I think that's something that travelers really try to do um when they're just more knowledgeable about how what might be taboo like you might go to a country a friend I was just talking to a friend she was like one of my biggest fears about traveling abroad is that like breaking a law and I didn't know I broke it. Um, so I think that's like a big differentiator from people that are, you know, like common travelers and people that just go out for vacation, you know, two or three times is that the vacationer might want to go to Japan or go to Africa or something for, to like as a bucket list item and try to like fully emerge in that in a way that might seem as though it's appropriating the culture, whereas, you know, a traveler might take that by doing like a cooking class or doing like a sewing class, like just kind of going across the experience um, slightly different so that it doesn't come across as offensive. And I think bloggers and Instagrammers are trying to do a better, a better part of that, even with, you know, with like Tiger King coming out and, you know, the realization of animals in, you know, the the care of those animals that are in environments like that. Um, I think that plays a big part as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And as, as travel influencers, travel content creators, I think we play a big role in not perpetuating stereotypes and perpetuating the, uh, the notion that if I want to dress up and celebrate Oktoberfest and wear a later hose in, and most 
of Americans think that I, I shouldn't say most, I can't generalize that, but there are people that think that Oktoberfest occurs in October when in reality it is to celebrate the coming of October in September. And they use it as an excuse to drink and have fun. And while drinking and having fun is not in itself wrong, wearing lederhosen as an excuse is. But, but also it's, it's, it's the marketing, you know, it's like Oktoberfest. It's like, okay, I'm going to, you know, everyone wants to go to Munich and like drink. So there's a lot of marketing that plays that part also with Cinco de Mayo. Uh, uh, yeah, everyone is ignorant. Of, uh, a lot of people I've met is ignorant about it, but then also that's the marketing that is out there. Like, hey, let's go and drink Mexico independence, which now it's like the independence of Puebla, which is uh, a, a small area in Mexico. So um, I guess just like, yeah, you know, even though if we're ignorant about it, like, yeah, I'm just going to go out and celebrate. At, at least you're exposing yourself to something new, to something I different. Don't... Yeah, but I, 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 I don't think ignorance is, um, can no longer be an excuse because I feel like we have an excuse. All, all the information, right. we have all the resources more than ever. I think the ignorance is bliss is no longer going to be, um, in my opinion, acceptable. I think we're moving into a new age, a new movement where if you don't take the time to educate, to inform, to meet people, to talk with locals, you're not doing your job. Um, you know what I mean? If you're going to be this influencer or whatever, I think you got to think of the bigger picture, like take yourself out of the equation. For example, if I see someone in a photo with a sombrero and just goes to Mexico and just blah, 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 I, you know, there's microaggressions, there's these subconscious, um, you know, uh, feelings that you can get without meaning to there's a you know there's a lot of these things and that's why it's important to educate yourself on the culture um and have these conversations because i i just don't think ignorance is, is going to be doable anymore like there's just no we got to take accountability and do better because we know better mm -hmm. i i agree with you in the sense and with influence comes responsibility and that if you're an influencer that is sharing information yes you should be really informed about it uh, but like not everyone is an influencer, like some people that like appropriate culturally about a, a celebration, they just want to go, most likely go and have fun. I have a lot of friends that have gone to Germany uh, to celebrate the Oktoberfest just because they just want to go and have fun. And they're not influencers or anything. They just want to go dress up and do it. Um, and that's it. Um, same with many other places I've been like um in, where like tourists just go want to have fun yeah appropriate uh, also i think like the community that you're going to plays a big role and they are the ones that draw the line between like okay this is offenses versus this is not this is fun like for example in venezuela we love when travelers comes and we want them to feel welcome and for us it's not really offensive if you try to do something that is traditional for us so uh, we're like very open in that sense. That that's something that to me is still uh, foggy. Um, you know, Jeanette, like to to go into the sombrero example. Um, you know, if you go and you're wearing a sombrero and you're wearing traditional Mexican garb and you're trying to celebrate Mexican culture, where is the what? And your intent is is well. Is it then okay to wear? Uh, the, the traditional garb of the culture you're celebrating if you're going for educational purposes uh, to immerse yourself in the culture is that okay I don't know um again I, I can't speak for everybody and just speak for myself but I will say what is the intention what is the if you're going to take a photo what is the caption what is the intention right behind it because that can make a huge difference um but again there you know I don't know. I have cousins. My family's from Mexico and my mother's from Mexico City. Um, someone could take a photo and she could be offended and I may not be offended or I may be offended and she's not offended. It, it's not black or white. It's not. That is a foggy area. Right. right? And I think that's why it, as an individual, um, if if coming from the in, influencer, whatever influencer means to, to you, um, coming from that perspective, uh, you know, being responsible for what 
you know, what you put out there because people will see it and people will hear. And we're living in this age where right now, even post-election, where there's a lot of, of noise happening. And if you're not, you know, it depends who you're watching or what you're listening to. I mean, you know, it's, it's, it's very powerful. Words are, are very powerful. Images are very powerful. Um, at, you know, when I was back in journalism school, we took media ethics. That was a huge, and media law, understanding, you know, ethical, what's ethical and what's not. I think that is really important, too. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> There's... I think, um, I think intention matters, but I don't think it all falls on intention because, like, I just remember seeing this Twitter post and it was... Um, it was a Chinese girl and she was like, our culture is not an aesthetic, it's our culture. Um, and I think that even goes for how it is in multiple countries where the culture is very rich. I think that also comes from um, kind of like a, a lost identity for the states. Um, so I think that intention matters. Yeah, but I don't think it all falls on intention because there are ways you can cross the line and your intent was all good, but that doesn't that doesn't stop that it crossed the line. Yeah, that and that's sort of where my confusion lies because um, who who's the who's the Canadian president or president? <laughs> Trudeau? Trudeau. <laughs> yeah, uh, Trudeau. So he he got a lot of backlash for dressing in different garb. I don't remember uh, which cultures he was trying to associate with. I don't remember, but I remember I know that he's notorious. Matil Matilda might. I mean, she's Canadian. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, she, when you said the Canadian, I was like, Matilda? <laughs> yeah, Matilda, do you... Do you recall when Trudeau did that, what he was dressing up as? I don't know if she's there still. But so so anyway, I mean, he... But his intentions were good, and he still faced backlash, and I understand why. And the the reason, part of the reason that this conversation even came to fruition is because well you know we love go traveling and really the primary motivation for me to travel is to learn about a new culture and meet the people that that occupy this new country and try their food and converse with them and see their architecture and understand their daily lives and just just learn just learn really i just i love learning about the world and i, I always and that's great that's like a great concept but like a lot of people don't travel to learn like if you think about it like they travel to go to pretty places or to like cross something off their bucket list um i don't i don't think most people's that just vacation their intent on traveling is to learn personally i don't, I don't know which i, I don't, don't think is necessarily wrong yeah. I don't know. I don't know if there's a way to measure it, like to know you know it's just travelers are so you know they're so complex and so diverse and um, who knows? I mean, there's really no way to measure that. I mean, I could be wrong. Maybe there's just studies and statistics. So I guess we, we all, I guess, have a good understanding of what it means to appropriate culture, what it means to try to walk a very fine line. But is there, Lou or Jeanette, you both can take turns chiming in on this. Is there a general rule of thumb that you would recommend for someone traveling to a new country or trying to celebrate a foreign culture in their own country that that is acceptable and that won't insult or harm the integrity or, of, or offend or offend the, the, the culture they're trying to celebrate? Is there a way to do it appropriately? In my opinion, as I said, I think that the, the, the community that you're visiting, visiting to will be the ones that will uh, set the tone for that. Uh, because I've, I've visited countries where they want me to do everything they do. And actually for me, I am like the one like back, like that is like, okay, like, but is this okay to do? Like, should I do this? And like, yeah, yeah, just do it. And they are the ones actually that take pictures of me and stuff. So I'm like, you know what? I, I'm just going to play along. And yeah. All right. I, yeah. Yeah. Don't really bother you. I think Hello. just, uh, is it? Hi, Matilda. I think we have you back. Hi, sorry. Sorry to interrupt. Is this any better? Yes, it is. Yeah. Much. Yeah. Okay. 
Jeanette, did you want to, did you want to? Oh, right. I was just going to say, I think just, you know, um, before you travel to a destination, maybe just do um, adequate research um, beforehand, maybe uh, different sources like a guidebook, but also a magazine, and maybe talk to somebody who was recently visited or somebody who lives there. Um, I think just trying to get as much, um, information about the culture for example I went to Egypt in March and before I went to Egypt um, I spoke with friends who were from Egypt I spoke with you know uh, travelers who've been to Egypt I read about Egypt I watched movies I I tried to learn as much about the culture uh, language everything I could before going um, because I think that's that's important. That's something that you can do. Um, mm -hmm. And like you said, there's lots of resources available online in the library, guidebooks, bookstores, you friends of friends, podcasts, movies. Um, and then I, I was happy I did that because, you know, you, you learn more things than you probably thought. And, and um, that's, that would be my recommendation. Yeah. I yeah. think, I, I, think that's I, important. I, I, with, with uh, what Jeanette has said and sort of going back uh, to something I was trying to say earlier, but I was having a few uh, audio issues in terms of um, whether intent matters. And I think for me personally, I don't think in most cases it does matter just because um, as Jeanette has said, you can do the research to find out what things are acceptable or not acceptable within a culture and whether your intent was to be hurtful or not. It's how it's perceived by the other person that I think matters. And for me, that's what makes the difference between cultural appropriation and, and um, cultural appreciation. If something is perceived by a culture as cultural appropriation, as um, discrediting the culture, as um, unacceptable in the culture, then that's what it is. It's not up to us, the other person who's done whatever it is to define or to uh, try and explain why it's not or why it was not intended that way. Um, and where research really comes into hand is giving you that perspective. I mean, of course you might not find everything um, online, but having done some research, you can know at least some of the things that are perhaps significant within a culture, um, what is acceptable in that culture, and then doing that due diligence will help you to avoid those kinds of situations where, yeah, you really did not mean to, but unfortunately that's how whatever you've done is perceived within that culture. Uh, so, I, I I agree I agree with you, um, but I, my my pushback I guess is I just I think if if a culture were to disagree with how someone is trying to appreciate that them, it's it just seems like a really weird area because you have someone with good intentions that's trying to learn and emerge themselves in a new culture and understand their culture and then that culture then says no, we don't like you doing that. Um, I don't know. It doesn't it stunt or or put a blockade on people being more accepting. Like shouldn't that shouldn't that culture in a sense be accepting of someone new learning about them and them joining together and doesn't that that mutual um appreciation for one another's culture bring I think I, I like that question because I think I, a prime I, example of that is a a white person wanting to have their hairstyle as dreadlocks. And I think that is a common situation or scenario where they have all of the well-meaning in the world, but for whatever reason, um, either the black community has said, no, we don't want that. We don't want you to be able to wear dreadlocks because that is part of our culture. Matilda, do you have any thoughts on that? I do actually. So I'll start by saying, um, I'm sure you've heard the saying that says the road to hell is paved with good intentions. So I think it doesn't really matter that you have good intentions, but I think what matters more so is, as I've said, how the people perceive it, but also what happens next. So just because a culture also perceives what you've done as 
being cultural appropriation or being disrespectful to a culture doesn't mean there isn't room for conversation there for them for them to explain to you why because sometimes it's the historical significance of something so of a hairstyle for example something that's been traditionally shunned when black people do it for someone else to do it we may not be in the space right now for that to be okay but it doesn't also mean one that that's how it's always going to be but two that it's not an opportunity for us to both go for us to explain to you why something like that is so hurtful to us why it's hurtful that we can't go into the workplace with that hairstyle not be called unprofessional and not be called all these negative things whereas then you do it and it's okay because that's also like with the example specifically of dreadlocks I think that's where a lot of people have an issue it's not mm -hmm. so much that you've done it it's the fact that when I do it it's a problem Right. So it's the one historical context of how it was looked at in the past and some of the things that have been tied to the hairstyle in the past. But even in the present, in terms of we are still in a space where we are taking that back, where we're taking ownership of that, where we're even relearning um, as a culture what that means to us and what they can mean to us in the present day. And then to you, it's just a hairstyle. So back to the point of saying, does that not take away from the um, kind of relationship building that can happen or um, I can't remember the exact wording you use. I don't think it necessarily does because it allows us to have those conversations whereby you can have empathy for the situation that I'm in and the history that I have with that situation. And then perhaps you will also be able to see why it might not be appropriate for you to be doing that. Yeah, I agree. I think education and informing yourself and speaking um, to people is important, but I also think when you're talking about culture, you know, there's subcultures to cultures, it, mm -hmm. you know, it's not one culture and then that's it. I mean, there's diversity within a culture and it's multi-generational. There's, it's so complex. So when you talk about culture, it, it's, it's really complex. Like, and like I said, I'm speaking from my, my perspective, but I can't speak on Matilda's perspective or, you know, anybody else's perspective because I haven't grown up in that. I don't know, but I'm here to learn. And that's why I think it's important to, to have these conversations because one thing I can say that I have experienced or I've heard other people experience is um, people get offended, for example, when they speak Spanish and they say, oh, you're you know, oh, you, you're Mexican. Oh, you're this. And they say, no, I am Venezuelan. I am Colombian. I am Guatemalan. I am this, you know, it's grouping people either by language or by, you know, looks or by whatnot and not really taking the time to understand, you know, more about them, more about their roots, more about their history, more about their country. You know, that's what I mean. Like it's, no, it's I not monolith. Either. It's, uh, yeah very complex mm -hmm. and i i take it from this perspective i take it from if i'm going to go to a country like i went to guatemala i went to egypt i'm going to take the time to do research to speak to the locals my intention is important to me it's good i'm going there to learn i'm going there to share stories it's not about me it's about them so i'm very you know open to uh just not knowing everything because we are go when we're travelers we're going to their country they're not you know we are, are going to them so it's not for us to be comfortable it's for us to learn we are going we are essentially visiting their their country um so i think the context is you know what is your intention why are you going to the country you know and part of travel for me is constantly being uncomfortable you're getting out of your comfort zone so i think trying to be comfortable and trying to be you know all that it doesn't matter you're if you're going to be in this industry you're going to be constantly learning and growing and being uncomfortable but for uh, you know a better purpose yeah i i agree with that and one question i've i've kind of thought about during this conversation is is it possible to appropriate the american culture because i think about if if bob and i had ever been offended in our lives for someone doing what we think is ours yeah. and i cannot come up with one single example so i guess my question is um at what point is do we find that 
as the world globalizes and people are more connected all over the world, not just physically, but also uh, via communication socially, is there going to be a cultural blending on all levels? I mean, right, we have more mixed cultures in the United States than any other country in the world. And I think that is why we want to celebrate different cultures is because we are a massive melting pot. Yeah, and that's sort of where I brought my my question back is like I the people this isn't really um, my point doesn't include the people with ill intentions or who are ignorant or just just lack the education, you know, on other culture. It's really the people that are trying to embrace it and understand it and and receive the backlash either way. And and then they receive the backlash either way. And my my worry is that the backlash might not be aimed and although that that culture perceives it and they're insulted by it and they say stop appropriating my culture is there any is there any negative consequences to that like is is the culture that feels as though they're being insulted by someone who's really trying to make an educated attempt at enjoying or appreciating it is there like is there this tribalism that is is happening and i think tribalism in general is just uh, it's just a huge issue for uh, in the United States right now, um, for the world in a lot of ways, and that's kind of that's kind of the area that I'm struggling, and I keep going teetering back and forth, and I understand everybody's points, and but I'm just stuck in this perpetual cycle, um, you know. It's catch twenty two. Right? Is there a way to break that barrier? Uh, I don't know. I, don't know there I think I think if you, I think if you're listening to people then there is a way to break that barrier. Because if people are offended, it means you've done it incorrectly. Like it doesn't matter that you did research and there's this one person from that place who said it's okay. If for the majority of the people in the culture or for a significant amount of the people in the culture, it's not okay, then to me personally, I don't see why it remains a question or why it remains an issue. It means you need to go back to the drawing board and think about the approach with which you're going to celebrate the person's culture I think it, it's the same thing with let's say being in a relationship like um, be it a friendship or an intimate relationship right if you say or do something to your partner to your friend and they don't like it, it even though you meant well right the fact that they are upset about it and they are hurt by it right it says something not necessarily maybe about you maybe it says so much more about them but that's also fine you have we have to be okay with the fact that it, what we do, no matter how well-intentioned, is not always going to be received the way that we want it to be received for a variety of reasons. And I'll go back, I'll use the example, for example, of First Nations, because we have this happening in Canada, and I see in the U.S. a lot, with the feather headdress, right? In Canada specifically, um, for a long time, it was illegal to wear a feather headdress. It was made completely illegal by law. You could be arrested, you could be fined, and all these things would happen to you. And yet it's such an important part of First Nations culture and it means a lot and you just only supposed to wear it if you've uh, you know, done all these accomplishments and it, they, they, it, there's so much behind it, right? Even before colonialism, then you have colonialism and you have that taken away. And now they finally have it and they're able to celebrate it. And then somebody wears it as a Halloween costume. And honestly, when you think about it, it's like, well, yes, it's annoying, but it's just a Halloween costume. What's the big deal? But if for you, you actively remember your dad, your mom going to prison for wearing the headdress. For you, you remember being pulled away from your, like you have all of these negative emotions that you tie to this, uh, to this thing, right? Of things that have happened to you, things that have happened to your family. It doesn't matter that me as Matilda, I think this thing is so beautiful and I wanna appreciate it. And so I wanna wear it, right? Like that matters less than the history and the um, all the things that are tied to it for First Nations. And so I think that's where, even though we mean well, we want to celebrate, we want to be a part of something. Sometimes being a part of something is actually being in the background of it, of just listening to the people telling you about what the thing is. And that's the appreciation is giving those people the space to, to be able to do it and we don't partake. And that's also okay. And I feel like that's something as travelers and as just people living in the global world that we have to be okay with at some point. Right, because at the end of the day, it's not about us. It's about sharing the stories and informing and, you know, uh, giving people, you know, cultures their, their um, voices, a, a platform to share. 
and to inform us and to educate us and to, you know, I, I, you know, for Oktoberfest, which it's okay, for example, I've not been there to Germany for Oktoberfest, but that's okay. But even here in the States, um, I'd rather just learn from somebody from Germany what is Oktoberfest personally than mm-hmm. just to go to drink beer. But again, it's going to be in, it's going to be an individual basis and you guys can have this conversation probably with hundreds of people in the travel community and you'll probably get, you know, a variety of perspectives and responses and um again, it's just it's just there's an, I I don't think it's going to take time but I think if, if we can learn and listen like what we're doing and like what Matilda was saying we can listen you know and, and try to better understand we'll come you know hopefully in the future more united more compassionate more empathetic more um I think that at the end of the day I mean that's what travel does right it helps unite us and understand that we're we're I mean that's what I think yeah, I think one of the one yeah, of the I conversations just... that Bob and I have had with one of our guests was that no one has ever come back from travel less empathetic. Right, travel is sort of a medicine for for closed mindedness. It, it it cures it in a lot of ways. I think. For sure. Yeah, I mean, no, you I told... to... oh, sorry. Go ahead, my dear. No, it's okay. <laughs> Go ahead. I was going to say that, yeah, you experience how things are done differently in, in other places and, and how something that might be uh, weird to you is something pretty normal over there. So and just immersing yourself in that is definitely uh, life-changing and like mind-changing as well. Right. Yeah. Something perceived like the the Dia de los Muertos, right? That's a holiday that's celebrated. Um, that you know, here in the states, it's celebrated, but in Mexico, I've been in Mexico City on Dia de los Muertos, and my family throughout my life, how they celebrate it, it's it's so it's so beautiful because the the you know the history and the intention of that holiday is to celebrate you know, those who have passed Um, and they create, you know, my family in Mexico creates a table with photos of those who passed with candles and food and, and, um, you know, but maybe to the outside world who may not understand, it may be odd or look, you know, what, what is it? Why do they have so many, you know, so it's like, just um, maybe when you go to the country and you just like, you know, I think Matilda was saying earlier, you just sit in the background and observe and, and just watch and, that that can be life-changing because you see you know you you don't have to like partake you can just see from a from a different view um and i think that that is also what travel does it 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 puts you in that space where you can be um an observer and you can view and and um and actually i think that's a great Mm -hmm. example for cultural appropriation because now because of the dia de los muertos we have coco and the movie the disney mm-hmm. movie and kids love that movie and then you see many kids in halloween like getting their fa- uh, their faces painted as the katrinas and i mean they they are kids they have good intentions uh they probably don't really know the story behind it besides the movie but they do it anyways because they 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 like it so i mean uh that's yeah cultural appropriation but i mean with a good intention and i don't know I mean that's that's a really good point. I, I've seen that movie like a hundred times. Oh, so good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and so she 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 loves it. And if she wanted to dress up like, you know the the, I can't pronounce it. I'm sorry, but the Katrina. <laughs> mm-hmm, is that is that wrong? Is that wrong? And that's that's like that's why I'm so back and forth on this. Yeah. Yeah. I think copying. I think, especially with that example of the movie, um, when you think about like when the movie came out, right? That's why people were upset at the movie makers because they knew that they would be like 
there's so almost like a domino effect, right? Of you have the movie come out, which appropriates the culture. And then you have these sweet, innocent kids who have no idea, right? Who we can't, I don't, I would say it's unfair to say that they're culturally appropriating, but as a result of someone else's cultural appropriation, right? Of presenting something without enough context, without um, all those other pieces in it, and maybe even without the consent or involvement, I don't know how involved, you know, the appropriate people were in the making of the movie, but you have, you know, somebody's original action have a domino effect of now other people, you know, wearing the costume outside of context and all that kind of stuff, right? And so I think that's where, if you talk about the media, uh, where the media has so much power and why people get really upset when it's the media because then they have that um, that impact of now having disseminated information in a way and controlling a narrative, somebody's cultural narrative, um, without those people being involved, without those appropriate people being involved. And I mean, it's not my culture, so I can't speak to whether those kids are appropriating, but I feel like anybody would probably have a hard time to say that, right? Like to really be able to say, we should be holding those kids accountable for wearing the costume. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, it's definitely very, very complicated, I think. It is. It's very complicated and complex. And like you said, there's no, I don't think you're going to get an answer. Like it's just going to be a constant evolving, you know, I don't know. I, maybe I'm wrong, but I think we're growing and we're learning. And as we are, um, I don't, I just, it's a very complex. Yeah. And, and you know, I mean, not being of Mexican descent, I, I thought that movie was great because I am a traveler and I personally obviously love learning about new cultures. And here I am able to show my daughter this movie that gives her, you know, a, a, a Disney version of what it's like in a different part of the world. And Disney over the past few years, I think has been doing that much better than they have historically, bringing new cultures to light. And so it, it to me, it's a great way to learn more about the culture of different places. Like Moana was, you know, the Polynesian Islanders, which I thought was incredible. And I, I, yeah, I don't know. So I think, I think this conversation on Coco is really interesting. Um, in when Coco came out, there was a really well done New York Times article that talked with the director who is a white guy from Cleveland about his vision to do Coco. And he knew that the Latino community would be very, would, or he would face heavy scrutiny from the Latino community if it wasn't done right. And so the article goes in to explain how they ended up uh, building the team to develop Coco, how they had cultural appropriation in the back of their mind throughout the entire development of the film which I think they started working on in 2015. So this was even pre the President Trump era. And it's it's really interesting from the, I guess, director's side, but the article doesn't necessarily talk about the perception from the Latino community, which I would love to see. Yeah, that is really interesting. I, I don't know what the response was. Um, either that would be interesting to find out um but i think what disney's intention with coco was was in a way to was trying to to show especially the younger audience the beauty of dia de los muertos and and how it's it's celebrated and and in a in a way that um that kids could could understand i mean my niece i have an eight-year-old niece and that's one of her favorite movies of all time um so it's interesting again um just like with everything i think you're going to find people who who will like it maybe not like it um it's just trying to like what you're saying find find the 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 medium line find the balance of you know how how to talk about culture and in an appropriate respectful way um i don't know it's interesting yeah i think that's i mean the, the the main the main point here is to just have respect and consideration and empathy towards towards any culture at all yeah. times and I, I think that's the best you can do and as long as you try to practice that and and i don't know it, it preach this understanding and acceptance then then that's it. You know, do your best and, and educate yourself. 
Yeah, I think I think the conversation has kind of been revolving around this point that we as travelers should be accepting of how others perceive you when you want to embrace their culture. But I think part of this conversation also needs to be the individual cultures having that conversation about when is it okay for others to use our culture and being willing to grow and being willing to let that happen, right? Copying is the highest form of flattery. No idea in this world is ever truly new and invented by itself. Take architecture, for example. The Roman architecture is used all over the world. Chinese architecture is used all over the world. And it's not, that I do not believe is a form of cultural appropriation. It is an evolution of architecture throughout ages. And I think that's that is where we're going. I think Jeanette, we you kind of touched on this that there is as we move forward through this time on our globally diversified planet that we will become not necessarily more and more homogenous as a I guess a world culture, but that we will start to accept our cultures are different and there will be more of a free flowing fluidity between cultures and allowing to use allowing cultures to learn and i guess transpose other cultures to their own i think it's important yeah as individuals that we listen that we learn that we inform ourselves and um, have that mutual respect. And also I come with a mindset that like, I don't know everything about everything yes. and that's okay. And that's okay because I don't, I, I, I'm not the expert on everything and I don't think anyone is. We're, we're all, you know, we have our expertise, but we still have room to grow and to learn. Um, so that's why I'm here because, I'm willing to also listen. I'm always happy to listen and to learn from others, you know, like Matilda, like, like you um, and everyone on this panel, um, because this is part of growth and growth is also having uncomfortable conversations or conversations that I may not know everything about. And that's okay. Cause that's what I want to do. I want to learn. I want to grow and I want to be, become, you know, a, a better person. Essentially. I want to, yes. I want to, <laughs> so Yeah. Right. Yeah. And that's something that I wanted to, and I think we, we definitely touched up on a few times now, is to not discourage someone from uh, enjoying a foreign culture and experiencing a foreign culture for fear that they may face backlash for appropriating it. Um, yeah, that, that's again, part of the experience as well. Yeah. Yeah. And I just want to go back quickly to the point about... Um, sort of cultures sitting together to decide or to think on what is acceptable for other people to do. And that is a great point, but it's also muddy waters because I, uh, I think Jeanette has said this uh, quite uh, fluently that no single culture is a monolith. There are always going to be a diverse um, diverse opinions and diverse perspectives on every issue. There's never going to be a culture that's going to be able to agree on everything. I mean, as controversial as the N-word is, I know some people who are okay with, uh, you know, non-Black people saying it, for example. So they just will never be a time when everything is going to be like a culture is going to say, yeah, it's okay for somebody to wear a sombrero because there will always be somebody who, uh, even if it's just one person who is not in support of that. Um, and I think for us as travelers, what that means for us going into any culture is, like we said, do the research, but also be prepared to know that we're not going to satisfy everybody. But if we are not going to satisfy everybody, the response is not to double down, to say that we're right, to say whatever. It's to be human, to be empathetic and to understand that people are allowed to feel that way. And we shouldn't be so defensive to come to try to say, well, my intent was this or my intent was that, but just to be ready to apologize, to be ready to listen um, and to hear why somebody feels that way. Because sometimes, um, you know, you go into a situation and then, you know, somebody makes a really good point and suddenly you're kind of like, you know, why didn't I think of that? So if we do it that way, then it becomes more of a learning experience. If we're willing to listen and we're listening to, willing to hear what is being said, then it becomes something where we actually gain more from that experience because we get to learn uh, more from that person in terms of, you know, what, where they're coming from and why the situation, um, you know, results in them feeling however they feel. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, definitely. Conversation. 
yeah conversation and listening and listening yes. is listening. so important not just hearing listening <laughs> Yeah, and you know, this is this is kind of maybe a little bit of a tangent, but I find it interesting that going back to something that Elliot said earlier, like, where is the American culture? Like, why is it that I don't even feel I'm, I'm actually envious of the rest of the world, you know, and that, that have this close knit, deep culture? I lack it. I and that's just a weird thing about being in the United States. I don't even I can't tie myself to a culture. I don't even know where I begin to get offended by someone appropriating American culture. Yeah, Bob, I think the closest thing for both of us, right? You're 100% Italian. I'm 25% Italian. And we don't really have that many Italian cultures left, minus the, you know, family style pasta dishes that we make at our family reunions. I, I technically, yes, I have. Um, I don't call myself that. So when people say that, if I were to say that I'm 100% Italian to an Italian person, they'd be like, no, you know, you're not. Right. I speak Italian. I can't cook. Uh, you know, I, I don't qualify. <laughs> well, I, yeah, that's a good point. I mean, I, I mean, I was born here, like I said, in California, but, I, but my family's from Mexico. So I have that culture as well. But, you know, Travel Unity, I think a couple months ago had a panel called American Voices where they had, you know, a, a great diverse group of, you know, travelers in the community um, from all different backgrounds and, and it was really great to hear so many different perspectives of what they felt being an American today meant to them. And again, I think you're going to get an individual response. I don't think you're going to get a one, one response for everybody. Um, to me, what being American, you know, means to me, it may mean something different to you. Um, and maybe I'll, I get offended. For example, we talked about when we travel abroad and, and people ask where you're from and you're American, you know, some of the things that may differ is who's president at the time, pol political upheavals. There's a perception on Americans based on politics, mm -hmm. which may, we may have nothing to do with that at all. But just being from this country and whatever's happening politically has a negative, can have a negative you know, perception. And that's one thing I say, like, you know, it, it's interesting in historic times. I mean, we're in the post-election, we're in the historic times. I feel like America right now, we are not all on the same page. Um, and people's, yeah, it's yeah, interesting times. Very. Yeah, that's the I think you in in talking about what is American culture um, as a Canadian, it's interesting um, because for me, like I see some level of American culture from when I go around to the different places, like it's so different from what I'm used to that I see a culture, if you can call it that, or I notice things that are different from my culture and therefore I associate them with American culture, which they may really not be. Um, like, you know, if you're in the South, if you're in Louisiana, for example, like there's very obviously a culture, but Mm -hmm. Same thing with even New York, like, you know, even the air is different. I'm like, oh my gosh, this is so, you know, and I know for me as a Canadian, I also thought that Canadians didn't really have a culture until I left Canada. And then I said things, did things and people are like, oh, we don't say it like that. Oh, we don't like do that yeah. when we cook that. And then that's when I started seeing, oh, wait, like there is a culture. There's a way that, of course, not like Jeanette has said, right? Like not every single Canadian cooks pasta or whatever the same way, right? But there's like these little things or mannerisms that seem so, they seem so mundane in the everyday. You don't think too much about them. And then when you go somewhere else and you see something uh, being done differently, that's when you go, oh, so maybe that like is, you know, something cultural or something uh, related to the place where I live, you know? So that's also the other thing I know for me that I've really appreciated about traveling was it also made me like, it made me look outward in terms of like appreciating other people's culture, but it also made me look inward in terms of like, oh, there's another way to do that. There's another way to say that. There's another way to do X. And then thinking more about how I do things and how I say things and how I approach things. Um, and yeah. how different that is from other places, kind of. So I don't know if kind of that made sense. I felt like I went on a tangent. But no, it, it did. Once you start comparing yourself to others, you see it a little more. Yeah. So Bob and I actually had a really interesting conversation with one of my cousins. And it was, I think, our 15th episode. And we we ended up calling it the third culture kid. And she was, and she was uh, I, 
I think born in the United States. I have to go back and check, but she is an American, but grew up in Turkey. Her Both of her parents were professors at a university in Turkey. And so she grew up there in her formative years up until she was about 15 or 16 and then came back to the United States for college. But she deemed herself uh, that term, and it is a real sociology term for as a third culture kid because she didn't feel like she fit in, fit in as an American when she came back to the United States, but she also didn't feel like she fit in as a Turkish kid when she lived in Turkey because she had American parents but because she lived in Turkey when she came back to America, she did things very differently. So she never felt like she fit in anywhere she went. And it was it was tough for her growing up. And I think there are many, many people like that where your own culture doesn't accept you because you have other cultural uh, traditions. Yeah, that was... Yep that is definitely relatable as like the child of an immigrant like my parents have like very strong ties to their culture having grown up in zimbabwe having uh ties to that culture and then having raised us to some extent with that culture but of course adjusted to some canadian level of canadianness and then being myself canadian and growing up in canada and in many ways i see myself i guess as canadian first just having been born and raised here but it's also like you do feel that weird space of um yeah like lack of belonging or because you you end up being that melting pot as you've talked about america being a melting pot i think a lot of children of immigrants especially like first generation kids i'm not sure about second generation kids mm -hmm. you yourself are a melting pot you pick from the things that you like about canadian culture you pick from the yeah. things that you like about whatever culture your parents are from and then worse off if your parents are from two different countries right you have a little right. bit of you know whatever and a little bit of that and then where you live and then he moves cities oh, like man. all these interesting things that you yourself end up um yeah i think very few people are individually um one culture right like yeah maybe some people who live in fairly homogeneous countries do but i think a lot of us living in north america specifically are very much very much a melting pot and that's probably why we struggle with some of these conversations is because we're not necessarily used to having to choose a side we kind of get to live the best of all worlds we get yeah. you know, right around the corner there's a mexican restaurant and around the corner there's a thai restaurant and like this and that right and and it's great and i do look forward to that sort of being more on a global scale but i mm -hmm. think a lot of people i guess still have a long way to come just because of the history that they have with their culture before they can maybe open up for other people to really like engage in their culture. But it is definitely an interesting experience, I think, being a North American, whatever that means. Right. <laughs> and uh, well, yeah, you know. Yeah, she really touched on a lot of good points because um, coming from Mexican American first generation background myself, growing up in a household where I was only spoken to in Spanish um, since I can remember, but going to school where everyone spoke English um, and then coming home and then a Spanish again and having those both languages, having, you know, my parents who really instilled their culture, traditions from Mexico. Um, and then I, spending all my summers in Mexico with my grandparents where you know, being immersed into that culture as a young child um, and not speaking any English and, and being there and coming back to the States and be, you know, coming back and forth. So I think the culture, you know, there's a lot of subculture and we, uh, you know, a lot of people are in that situation and it is a multi-generational um, as well because I have a grandma who's 85. She's, you know, now dual citizen and lives in the States, but she doesn't want to drive a car. She doesn't want to speak English. And that is her choice. Mm -hmm. um, so I know when I go to grandma's, she's only going to speak Spanish. She's going to watch her Spanish TV, Spanish news, cook hers. And that is her choice. Um, um, but for me, I'd like to do both. I like to do my traditional Mexican and American culture. Um, and that's why I think it's, it's so complex, right? It's, it's so diverse. Um, I, but I'm proud to be an American as well. I'm very proud to be American and Mexican. So for me, it's, it's interesting, but yeah. beautiful. It is. Um, I, at some points in my life, I kind of wish I had uh, at least 
grown up with a second language in some form or other. Our our school district actually ended up teaching Spanish at, starting in second grade, and we had to take it every year until we were sophomores in high school. And I'm very appreciative of that now. I don't think I appreciated it then. Yeah, I wish I was bilingual. I've tried. As an adult, it's incredibly hard to pick up a language. I'm too busy. But um, yeah, I, I I think just you know wrapping this conversation up and bringing it full circle, the it's it's great that we are able to have this conversation. To me, one of the best things about being alive and being a traveler is the opportunity to learn about new cultures, and and I'm glad and thank you you know for coming on and joining us today. To, to shed new light and give us new information on this. And, and I think I, I personally have more things to think about and consider yeah. as, I, as I look towards, you know, outward to other cultures. And, and, and yeah, I think as long as we continue to educate and keep intention in mind and understand that the best intentions still may not be enough. And sometimes you just have to back off and accept it. And, and do what you can to enjoy it. Yeah. So the conversation is far from over is what you're saying. <laughs> I, it, yeah, I, it, it's still, it's just, it's just a very gray area. And it, but it's, it, it's interesting. We could do this again another time, maybe. Yeah, maybe revisit it in four years, see if anything uh, changes. Yeah, we, we, I think we might live in the most culturally diverse country on the planet. And going back to trying to identify American culture, I don't even know if you could. You could in, in some sense, but trying to compare someone who lives in downtown Manhattan to someone who lives in rural Texas, you might as well be comparing someone from Sweden to Tanzania. Like they're just so vastly different in a lot of ways that mm -hmm. it, it's hard to pin one, one culture for America. So, all right. Well, thank you. Thank you for joining. I really appreciate it. We had a few people drop off in the middle. Some person, you know, Ariel had to catch a flight. Lou had to jump off, but we appreciate your time today. So for those of you listening, the, the links to people's websites and their, their social media will be in the show notes section of this podcast and it'll be on YouTube. It'll be everywhere. So thank you for tuning in. Thank you for our panel members for joining us and we'll be in next week. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Bye.